Right, hello and welcome to the latest webinar in the Elemental Talks program for 2022. Our topic today, the water energy carbon nexus, how saving water can help us achieve our net zero goals in our session sponsored by the lovely people at Triton Showers. We chat for the next 60 minutes. My name is Jim McClelland. I'm founder and editor of Sustmeme, Meme, home to both the magazine and the top 500 rankings. Joining me on the panel this afternoon are Ben James, sustainability manager at Moat Homes, Richard Lupo, Managing Director, Shift Environment, and Daniel Lintel, Sustainability Manager at Triton Showers. It is all live with Q&A to finish. So pop your questions in the ask a question box at the bottom, probably in the middle of your screen. The clue's in the name. You pose them, I'll ask them, they'll answer them. Right, this webinar forms part of a program of talks hosted and produced by Elemental, elementalexpo.com. For those of you not familiar, it's the online community for professionals focused on innovations in heat, water, air and energy, the vital elements within the built environment now and in the future. You'll find a full diary of events on the website, range of upcoming webinars, you can also now view the back catalogue, whole host of topics, all available on demand, who's who of great speakers, and I should add, everything is free to access. Plus, this year, the physical real world in person Elemental Expo will take place at the NEC Birmingham alongside the installer show 21 to 23 June this year, 2022. So see you there. Right, we've got a lot to cover today. So it's going to be a pretty brief intro from me in terms of the topic water energy carbon nexus. This is the third and final webinar in this first Elemental Water Sustainability Series produced and associated with Triton. And we're going to explore, explain, encourage the linkages to be made between the issues of water sustainability as they play out residential markets and the broader climate agenda, including energy use and carbon emissions. That is the water energy carbon nexus. Our expert panel will start by joining the dots in sustainability terms. They're going to be talking us through policy drivers, business markets. The discussion will also explore the relationship between the tech push and the demand pull. And we'll make connections between the specification of water efficient bathroom fittings and achievement of those grand net zero ambitions by 2050. To help us make these linkages visible and relatable for customers, I should mention that Triton has developed an online water and energy savings calculator. The tool's been designed to support people on both sides of the counter. It helps raise awareness amongst householders about the environmental impact of their showering habits, general water use patterns. Plus, it provides those working in house building, specification, plumbing, with a better understanding of how vital resources are being consumed in the home. And finally, I should mention that Triton Walking the Talk is committed to move the dial on sustainability at a corporate level, working to achieve carbon neutral certification this year, 2022, and full net zero status big piece of work by 2025, which will be the year of the company's 50th anniversary. So nice big birthday present from them to us and us to them as it were. Right, let the debate begin. You'll see some notes in the chat. I can see we've already got a question in the box at the bottom. So clearly the audience is ready. So start, we're going to explore the water energy carbon nexus, what it means for residential, some of the opportunities, the challenges involved in net zero targets, sustainability improvements. So obviously I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves, explain their perspective, share some opening insights. So it's briefly a kind of who are you? Where do you fit into the puzzle? Where do you think the housing market in the UK is right now? with making these linkages I'm talking about between water, energy and carbon. So first, a housing association perspective from strategy to efficiency and of course engagement. Ben, your opening thoughts, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ben James. I'm the sustainability manager for Moat Homes. Um, and essentially where we sort of fit into the puzzle, we've got net zero targets. So we want to be a net zero organization by no later than 2050. Um, you know, we're, we're conscious that there's a housing crisis um, and our objectives include ambitions to meet the housing needs. It's key for us to provide affordable, safe and comfortable homes. Um, you know, we're aware of sort of the energy and water linkage and we know that 23% of total UK's home energy use can be attributed to heating the water. So where we're installing heating systems, there's a, an ongoing obligation there to try and help save water energy and money and clearly carbon as well um but yeah the cheapest water and energy is the water that, that isn't used in the first place so from a housing provider's perspective we look at behavioral advice and technology 
as a combination and we need to reduce the, the heating and water demand you know that renewables have got a role to play as well um, you know lower flow temperatures for, for heat pumps and solar thermal can, can work well and just to say in, in previous roles i've worked um on southern waters and thames waters metering programs for an organization called groundwork and that's that's the instruction for myself excellent thanks Brent. so there we are strong reminder that we are in a situation of housing crisis and need keywords like affordable, safe, comfortable underpin all this discussion. Uh, but a nice point about behavioral advice and tech in combination. And we've all seen a number of studies where they've done the two separately and then the two together. And there's such a multiplier effect when you have both the behavioral work and the tech and kit and installation happening at the same time. So now Richard, if I come to you, an expert driving sustainability in the built environment, from science-based targets, ESG, all the way through to housing standards. Where do you see us and uh, where are we right now, Richard? Hi, thanks, Jim. Yeah, Richard Lupo, Managing Director of Shift Environment, and um, the part we play in the helping landlords get to uh, net zero targets and loads of other environmental targets is we do the reporting and sort of address level strategy development, so to get to net zero, but also all the other environmental issues, including uh, water efficiency. Um, I think we, we, where we are overall, we, we're not, um, we use more water per person per day than our future environment will provide. So um, there's been some really good um, studies from the Environment Agency mapping climate change, drier summers, things like that, with a estimate of what water efficiency we need. And we, at the moment, we're exceeding that. Um, so we definitely need to do something on that one. I can, yeah, all the figures I've seen uh, echo what Ben says, that the quarter of the typical energy bill will be spent on heating hot water. Um, it's a massive energy um, cost, carbon emissions, but also a cost to the resident as well. Um, there's actually quite a few benefits for water efficiency for, um, for landlords as well. I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, I think new build, the part G is pretty good. That's getting about the right water efficiency, nice balance there. My concern on that one is how well it's regulated um, in terms of uh, building control. Are they going there and looking at the water efficiency or builders just putting anything they want in there? Um, I'm not sure people know about the forthcoming dry in summers. So that's another thing that uh, might be a bit of a, um, a, a bit of catch up to go on there. Um, the, there's no driver, as far as I can see, no legislative or compliance driver for existing homes. So I'm hoping, and we're starting to see that in our work with um, ESG reporting. A lot of landlords are coming to us for ESG reporting, mm -hmm. and we put their water efficiency figures in there for them. And then I think the other thing to touch on is from maybe not on an individual home level, but on UK PLC, the water companies, the amount of energy they use to pump around the water around the system is, is colossal from a UK perspective. For an individual home, is you know, the last time I calculated, it's like 12 kilos of carbon and embodied carbon. But, um, you know, you add that up for 27 million homes and that, that's huge. So, um, yeah, I think that a, a way to go on regulation and enforcement and compliance and understanding a way to go on everything excellent so thank you so some nice issues in play there <clears throat> water use per person we're exceeding carrying capacity if you like i think maybe some of the audience will be familiar with the idea of earth overshoot day and the fact we're using resources we basically don't have um energy and carbon cost um positives about part g but a little uh, caveat there about whether there'll be the policing which means that it actually happens in practice. And then a nice final point, context, the energy use in terms of water utilities, which um, is, is perhaps the elephant in the room, if you like. Uh, so now, Dan, so as an industrial designer and sustainability specialist at the UK's leading shower manufacturer, where do you see us right now, Dan? Okay. Um, first of all, thank you. Um, I'll give you a quick introduction to myself. So I'm uh, Dan Lintel. I'm the sustainability manager here at Triton Showers. Um, I've only been in the industry for about three years. Uh, prior to joining Triton and working in the new product development group, um, I worked uh, mainly on sort of medical pharmaceutical drug delivery equipment. So I come very much from a, a sort of a, an evidence-based uh, background um, and believe very strongly in using um, evidence and science to, to, to guide uh, design development choices and things like that. Um, I've had a long, very long-standing interest in sustainability and it's 
it's wonderful that uh, I've, I've come to an organization who are embracing this so so fully and our, our, our uh, very challenging target of being net zero by 2025 is is, is testament to that um uh, currently my, my main focus within triton is, is supporting new product development projects where there is a real strong sustainability element to them a primary element they all have a secondary element um, but also I'm leading the, uh, the carbon footprinting work. So we've just submitted for carbon neutrality, which you mentioned earlier. Um, so all the data for 2021 has been submitted. Um, and I'm currently leading the work on our scope three footprinting, which is a, is a huge, huge bit of work. But we need to baseline that to be able to understand what our journey is going to be um, for uh, to, to net zero. OK, so that'll be used to set our science based targets. OK, so that's me. That's my sort of role within Trident. Where where do I think we are um, in terms of uh, housing and water use? Um, I would say up until very recently, I think there was a, a fairly low understanding uh, or even interest in sort of energy use, water use, uh, and particularly carbon. But two key things I think have happened that are changing that landscape. Um, the first one was, was COP26. We were all exposed to a lot more information about this idea of carbon. I think for a lot of people, carbon is still a bit of a, uh, an, unknown, an unknown that people are talking about, but we don't really understand what it means. Uh, the other one is, is obviously the, the ongoing energy crisis, which seems to be um, getting worse, if anything, uh, particularly for uh, household bills and particularly in gas usage. Um, and, and I think those things have forced um, the average user, myself included, to be looking very closely at my bill and going, what can I do about this? Now, space heating and stuff, I think we sort of, as a, as a nation, we kind of get that. We understand that it takes a lot to do. But, but sort of water usage and heating our water is a bit hidden. Um, you know, I think we can all visualize a bath full of hot water mm -hmm. and we can see well that's quite a lot but a shower because it disappears it's sort of a bit more hidden and a modern shower coming off a combi boiler with a decent pressure behind it you're probably using even more water than you might do in an actual bath if you're not careful so we need to start to help people to sort of visualize that so so where we are i think i would quote uh, donald ronsfeld when he said you know we've probably moved from uh, carbon and all this stuff being an unknown unknown which we didn't care about because it didn't cost us a lot and it was a bit hidden to it's now a a known unknown. Um, we know about it, but we're just trying to work out how big are these pieces and how do they all fit together. So uh, that's sort of where I think we are as a uh, as a country. Uh, there's uh, just pick up on something Richard said. Um, I think new builds a bit more focused on it. We've got Part G, but there's a huge retrofit market mm -hmm. and yeah. your day to day people, um, social housing, where you're retrofitting these things. How do you make the right decisions? And that's where we need to rely on science and scientists to to help guide us in that um, to understand the full ecosystem over there. Anyway, hopefully that was a... No, excellent. Thanks. No, that's given us some nice context. And while I do note this, if, I don't know if you see there, Dan, Chris Billingham's actually put a little question about Triton and Scope 3 in the chat. So I don't know if you'd like to type him a little answer, if you wouldn't mind, while I um, uh, sum, sum up a few of the things you said. So three years in the sector, two of them have been COVID. So it's been an interesting welcome to uh, our, our line of work, if you like. Um, from a company point of view, keywords like data, scope three, on which you just got a question, and it being a journey, um, big word retrofit, we'll be coming back to that, no doubt. And a nice point I think you made about, if you like, the blue planet generation, shall we say, um, waking up, especially with the, the coverage and media um, buzz around COP26, but still the suggestion that water is still a little off the residents green radar at the moment so there's work to be done in terms of these kinds of linkages which we will be discussing this afternoon so thank you for the intros there so now this middle section and i'm glad to see those questions we've now got a couple in the box already so the middle section i've tagged it challenges and conflicts so that gives you an idea of where we're going here so i'd like to zoom in on specifics challenge our panel a bit as to why they're still fundamentally a disconnect in thinking around water, energy and carbon for many players in the housing sector, of course not all, and how residents ultimately get shortchanged on sustainability as a result. So I'm asking what's the problem? Awareness, <laughs> demand, cost, culture, tech, market forces, and what needs to happen for joined up thinking and doing, I should add, to start delivering as these multiple wins, saving water, energy, cost and cutting carbon we've heard about. So Richard, we keep hearing about a wall of money available for clean and green tech and the rise in popularity of environmental, social and governance, ESG metrics, we've had mentioned already, climate finance. We're hearing about these every week. We also know, however, that households are responsible for some 26% of final energy consumption, 40% of UK emissions. 
use over 50 gallons of water every 24 hours in the bathroom alone. So all these numbers, yet the residential sector still seems strangely off the investment radar. It's slow to report sustainability gains, reap these supposed financial rewards. So why is this? Why, why is there that gap somehow, Richard? Yes, why, why, why? Uh, yes, really important because, um, you know, water is a basic human need. We all need it as humans. Um, how much we need is a bit uh, debatable. I mean, I see figures, I see uh, back 10 years ago, we were using about 160 litres per person per day. But then you look at what um, where we are now, it's a bit better, what the Code for Sustainable Homes brought in, what the um, United Nations used for planning uh, refugees. I used to be in the army and they had water planning uh, figures there down to six litres per person per day. Atlantic sailors used four and a half litres per person per day. So, you know, we need to decide on what, on, on what that is is as well so but i think um before i go on to you know what may be some of the problems i'll start on the esg thing i think that is starting to have an impact people really i mean we we as consultants we do a lot of reporting on that and so we always put the uh, water efficiency figures in that because part of the uh, overall environmental figures and people say that that's having an impact on what they do so i'm really happy about that but overall i think it's a combination of you know poor awareness of the whole issues as i talked about in my introduction there's complete lack of uh, regulation of any sort um in the market um for existing homes part g like i say is getting there but is that being enforced we see a lot of horror stories on the energy side of part g or not of uh, part l um you know people are saying that uh, we've built a great home and when you go and measure the carbon from it it's you know people are using about four times as much energy as uh, what the uh, design suggests so there's a lot of uh, suspicion there on the enforcement part of it um the i, th I think um I'm, I'm ever so hopeful but uh, you know when things like decent homes there's thermal comfort as a measure i'm hopeful that the social housing white paper which specifically mentions resilience to climate change will feed into the next version of decent homes and decent homes too and that will hopefully uh, if we look at water efficiency as part of resilience to climate change so we don't end up with water shortages or water stress i uh, hopefully that the um, the regulator and social housing will start looking at um regulating on actual water efficiency in homes um there's a lack of tools like i say we have had to develop our own tool for mass uh, water efficiency assessment it's not like um you can do the big things on the energy efficiency that, that's the quite established metrics for all of that but water efficiency is really pretty um uh slow on the uptake there um also what's in it for the landlords is a split incentive they make the investment but the resident, um, the resident recoups the benefit in terms of uh, cheaper energy bills. So the, the landlord themselves can't recoup the um, can't recoup the investment they make. So there's a perceived split in incentive, and I think there's stuff that can be done there on a sort of regulatory uh, basis on that one. Uh, targets, numerical targets. That, like I mentioned in my introduction, the Environment Agency about ten years ago did a really good job, and they put a figure. When you start looking for that now, all the individual company, water companies seem, seem to be playing that down, and there's no reference. They're not giving themselves a smart target uh, to aim for. That's looking in their catchment area. So you know how much how much is enough. So it's a. I think there's a big lack there. Um, and the f the final one, and I'm glad Triton are doing their stuff on the, the energy efficient uh, showers. But you know, I had one done in in my bathroom uh, recently, and I specifically asked for uh, water efficiency. But I measured it the other day, and it's it's well over the eight liters a minute, <laughs> which I, I don't know probably reflects my uh, poor project management rather than anything else. But um, I, in what. So the manufacturers aren't doing it. It's not like toilets where, you know, you can't get anything except for a water efficient toilet now, uh, unless you paid lots of money. Um, the, I would like to see the standard showers, the standard wash basin taps, the standard baths or water efficient. Um, and then I suppose just just another little thing I want to pick in because I put in one of those aerated shower fittings into my shower and they cut, really cut the water down a lot. But it also cut um, and it felt like a great shower to me because of the water droplet size and the sensors in your arms and things um but um it really cut down the steam in the bathroom in the shower room afterwards 
And that means there's less water vapor around to start causing mold growth mm -hmm. and uh, all the black on the yeah. um, on the tile grout, which is a sort of massive uh, call back uh, feature for maintenance nice. on housing associations. So, I, yeah, to answer the question, I think there's a, there's a total lack of awareness on all levels, manufacturers, government, regulators, <laughs> housing associations and residents. And I think it's just sort of raising awareness, building good targets, building good regulation, really, I think is the way forward. Excellent. Thank you. We're really, well, we're really getting into the difficult stuff now. So nice point at the top you made about it being a basic human need water, but of course, question of how much is enough and the four and a half litres for Atlantic sailors is a, is a, is a, is a, is a bar not many people could reach, I think. But um, uh, in, you mentioned the awareness piece and of course you listed, and we're being frank here, lack of regulation, in some cases, tools, targets, performance gap. I mean, in terms of ESG and investment for construction and building in general, I think in many ways, we need to just remind ourselves that they're in the business of risk to a great degree, insuring against and investing in terms of risk profiles. And that's where the data that we're beginning to talk about, that's how they're going to quantify risk value assets. So I think it is emerging. We all know there's more data every year in our business. And I think that's bringing us closer to investability for some of the people who need that kind of information to make decisions. Nice point about need for win-win incentives, i.e. what is in it for the landlord, question mark. You know, we need to remind ourselves they are they are, they are in business in many respects. Um, it's uh, They're not all charitable um, causes. And, um, and yeah, I also note really, and maybe Dan will pick up on this later, but you were throwing down the gauntlet to the manufacturers as well, which um, is fair. It is a, <laughs> exactly, good catch there. So it is, a, yeah, there is a, it is a team game and everybody has a role to play and some um, could could do more. So nice uh, conversation also going on in the chat here. Thanks um, to the panel for picking up on some of the points from uh, Samantha Mant and um, Perdeep, for example, there. Um, right. So in this challenges and conflicts bit then. So now I'm coming to you, Dan. So um, I'm saying, you know, your water energy savings calculator, great tool. Helps raise awareness amongst householders, as we mentioned, useful for designers, specifiers, builders, installers. My however to you, though, is realistically, you kind of hope to bring about widespread behavior change, overhaul industry norms on your own. It's not going to happen. So how are you going to mainstream these issues and whose help do you most need in order to make the difference we're talking about now? OK, no, very, very good question. Um, the thanks for mentioning the tool. The, the, the tool came about from me wanting to understand what was going on. It was had no purpose beyond that. But then the, the revelations that it gave me were shared within the organization. And then we decided to make it public. Um, so it's useful for mm -hmm. starting that debate. It's never going to change use behavior on its own, it, but it may make people more aware of it. I've seen that in my own household. Um, my daughter, when I explained through, I've seen a behavior change with her. She's only 10 um based on that understanding but you're right the tool in and of itself is not going to do that so we, we need to sort of engage more widely um with with people we need to help users primarily to understand the link to start to give them real-time data and to use um some sort of behavioral nudge type um uh, techniques which i think one of your panelists in, a, in an earlier talk talked about um to yeah. help them understand it's about making those small changes so whether you you're a 20 minute shower and you go to 19 minutes or you're a three minute shower and you get managed to get it to two don't know how you do that but if you could um that has an impact and one of the things the calculator is able to do is it, it tells you how much money water and carbon would you save by that small change of behavior and and sometimes that's enough to oh okay i'm more interested in that none of us have a very good um understanding of time within the shower for some some of us it's our thinking time i know from personal experiences where I have some of my, my better ideas. Um, but but if you ask me how long I spend it there, I don't know. Geekily, I have actually measured it now because I'm, I'm, I'm interested from a professional point of view. But for a lot of people, they don't have that connection. So um, we need to, as a, as, a, as a business, but as an industry, help consumers understand the, the, uh, the impact of the choices. But it's not just the, the end user in the shower. It's also the people specifying it fitting the, the houses out to help them so that the ecosystems link together they work together um, and they can help people make the right choices um, just to pick up on richard's point about um, uh, showers or, or, or things having fixed um, flow regulators what have you and we do supply all of our showers with a flow regulator in them 
Unfortunately, they are user serviceable. Uh, and my concern with Part G is people say, yes, there you go. There's a shower. It's got a, an eight litre flow regulator, 10 litre flow regulator in it. And they go, brilliant, sign off Part G, take it out. And the installer may even say to the customer, you want better shower, just take that bit out. And then suddenly all of that's lost. Now, they don't see that because water is, for us, it falls out the sky a lot of the time. So it's, it's plentiful, apparently plentiful. But we've lost the, the ability to understand actually what it means. Um, so hence the CACA is there to try and illustrate, and I'll, I'll perhaps talk a, a little bit later about um, the number of water butts full of water we could save with very small changes to it. Okay, so uh, that's sort of um, how, to, how we ma mainstream. It's going to be engaging with with, mm -hmm. with people who are making assurances, whether they be users or specifiers, host builders, those sort of people. Whose help are we going to need? Well, I think there are three things that drive the overall em environmental performance of water use in, in, in the household. Um, that's the, the quantity and the temperature of the water that is used. Okay. It's the efficiency of the system overall, the heating efficiency and, and heat transfer efficiency, and the environmental profile of how you heat that water in the first place. Okay, those three things have got to come together. Um, those things we need to engage with in, in two the quantity and temperature. That's more of a use um, metric, if you like. That's mm -hmm. something that as, as, as individuals, we can choose to do it. Yep. Um, so clearly things that provide real time data to help people understand cause and effect of those yeah. things and quantify in terms that mean something to them, whether that's number of trees that would be required yeah. to offset the carbon, whether it's <clears throat> cost, those sorts of things, whatever is going to help you change your behavior. We need to support that. And I call on the industry as a whole to, to provide those next generation products, which will have that, that sort of data awareness. We see it in everything else. We should start seeing it um, uh, in this industry in particular. OK, um, the other two things are probably more macro issues. OK, so mm -hmm. I think we need to have um, government uh, uh, support to uh, to decarbonize the, the grid electricity. You know, that's energy that we can get, hopefully, from sustainable sources. And if we can use that energy to heat water, we're not using fossil fuels to do so. OK, now that might be in electric shower. That's a nice, simple mm -hmm. solution. But it might be in other forms of electric heating. It's your, your air source heat pumps to some degree, um, uh, your, 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 your solar hot water systems, which are pumped around using electricity. Those sorts of technologies need to, to be brought to the fore. But we need government to help fund and promote the scientific research into this to help provide that objective evidence. So it's not Triton or uh, Myra or anybody else saying these things. It comes from independent people who are supported by that. Maybe it's the Energy Saving Trust, those sorts of thought leaders, opinion leaders, who can who can distill the scientific information down to a level that you and I can can understand and can act upon. Okay, so that I, we definitely need governments and those sort of um, those organisations to support that to really engage with that. Um, clearly, we need we need individuals, companies to engage with mm -hmm. it as well. Um, and to start that debate. And so, you know, I'm, I'm very much trying to promote uh, this, this debate and I want to get actively involved in it with hopefully generating next generation products that will, will help with this, but also working with the likes of Ben, Richard and others in the industry so that we get a collective narrative there that's going to make sense and we create, as I keep using the term ecosystem, we create those ecosystems that are going to work, that are going to drive benefits both commercially for or at a cost level for our for customers and users, but also for the for the planet as a uh, as a biosphere. Excellent, thank you. So, so nice nice point at the top about um, the tool or calculator as um, you know effectively a conversation start or jumping off point where where behavioural nudge begins. If you like, um, need to help the users, the consumers understand their impacts, make these links, uh, and then ideally that will inspire the changes. But a couple of key words there. It is a question of choice. It is choice, you know, and that focuses on the consumer and therefore we need engagement in order to help and support those choices. Whose help do you need? I thought you made a nice distinction in terms of quantity and temperature. That's a use thing. And that's where we're talking maybe with the consumer. System efficiency, environmental profile, that's bigger picture stuff, which led you on to mention that government funding and promotion is needed. And the only thing I'd say there apart from round of applause but obviously the industry needs potentially more of a voice in terms of getting that help from government and i think there are question marks about how effectively we lobby whether it's housing or building or whichever bit of the industry but i think there's an argument we could work harder and better trying to get some of that um support so 
Now, if I'm coming to you, um, Ben, uh, Mo, you were uh, you were launching zero carbon energy sprung retrofit pilots oh, 2019, and despite skyrocketing gas prices, forcing tenants into UK wide fuel poverty, and we are most definitely in that bracket at the moment. The sector as a whole, it barely seems to be getting to grips with tackling water, energy, and carbon together. So, really, I'm, I'm challenging us to what is the holdup? Is it the push from policy regulation is too weak? Is it the pull from consumer market demands not strong enough? Or is it simpler than that? It's just lack of knowledge, skills, desire on the part of housing providers. So I'm asking you to point the finger really. Where's the hold up? Who and what's the problem here then? Yeah, so I mean, obviously there's a few variables involved, but um, you know, one of them, you'd be looking at the skills gap um, really, with with the industry so you know you've got installers that are used to you know putting in gas boilers and maintaining those but as we're shifting towards you know the electrification of you know heat and water we need installers to be clued up on you know heat pumps and how they perform at optimal levels and to relay that information and, and best practice in terms of operating them to the end users um, you know, the government have got targets to install 600,000 heat pumps yep. um, annually by 2028. That's not really that far away. And, and considering, I think it was only about 60,000 that was installed last year. Clearly, there's uh, a big, you know, gap to make up there. But there's, you know, ways that, you know, homes can be retrofitted to make them both more energy and water efficient on the journey to, to decarbonising the, the built environment. Um, I mean government have committed to, to building back better and greener um, mm -hmm. supply chain needs the confidence to, to implement measures at scale um, more from the energy side but typically you know funding would be there um, for a short duration and taken away so you know with the introduction of social housing decarbonization fund there's linkages there between you know saving water and energy mm -hmm. if you can um, you know get get some of these projects off the ground but you know legislation and regulations are, are key to it um you know let's say that funding needs to be robust and over the long term and i think there needs to be a shift from pilot culture um to doing things at scale so um you know we need to have sort of no regrets measures and with regards to both energy and water efficiency let, let's just focus on the things that we know um work well and, and access that low hanging fruit and, and tackle the more difficult uh, measures a bit further down the line. Um, you know, we need to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. Um, that, that's clear with everything that's going on at the moment. Um, you know, renewables yeah. such as wind and solar PV are, you know, a great way forward. And from housing association customers perspectives, energy and water efficiency measures may not be particularly appealing. Their focus may be on more you know having nice shiny new kitchen and bathrooms so it's explaining to them the benefits of having a, a water and energy efficient home how that can free up disposable income alleviate fuel poverty um but yeah i mean coming back to regulations you know changes to the building regulations this year and the introduction of future home standard should push us in a direction where new and existing stock will be more water and energy efficient and the carbon footprints will be reduced for householders um you know we, but we need to do more and, and and quicker really in order to hit those longer term goals of, of being net zero by 2050 um and when it comes to you know efficient systems they only operate at optimal levels when those end users are giving the behavioral advice and you know, this could be in the form of you know demonstrations at handover or access to um, leaflets or videos via ourselves as a housing provider to you know support them it's not just to fit and forget we need to, to support people uh, moving forward and yeah in, in terms of in-house and upskilling is required within housing providers providers to encourage deeper retrofits where we'll consider, you know, energy and water saving measures. Um, and then 
sort of on a higher level um, housing providers there's, there's a difficulty in striking a balance between you know decarbonizing stock and building safety commitments um, although there is that overlap um, but what we're working on at the moment is amending specifications for bathrooms and kitchens so we've got reduced capacity baths being installed aerated shower heads flow regulators as Richard and Dan have mentioned before um, you know simple shower timers and it's sort of signposting our customers using our comms team to water companies that can provide these products you know free of charge and using our social media channels just to you know highlight how much money and how much carbon is associated to, to use of energy and water in a, in a domestic environment so yeah there's quite a bit to think about but i think we are you know on, on the right trajectory for a, a lot of things but yeah yep. really more, more needs to be done and, and quicker if we want to hit you know overall ambitions excellent thanks yeah quite a lot of work to be done as you said initially building better and greener but you mentioned the example for instance of uh, 600,000 heat pumps we've discussed on previous webinars with elemental as soon as you do the maths in terms of skills and bodies and days required to fit them it's very difficult to understand how some of those targets are going to be realized there are supply chain issues we know of course these have been exacerbated in a in many respects recently by covid and brexit um Legislation and regulation is critical. We're hearing this repeatedly, but a nice point about the need to shift from this kind of pilot phase into real volume mode. Of course, innovation is important, but it's scale. With a lot of these sustainability things, it's about scale, it's mainstreaming, it's rollout, it's making it easy, affordable, doable, more and quicker. I think were the words you used there, Ben, but I, I like your other little point about uh, more and quicker, but it's not fit and forget. This is not just throw stuff and ideas at people and leave them to it. They need support on an ongoing basis to understand how to use them and get the best out of them and appreciate um, uh, where they're going and what they're doing. So, which brings me kind of nicely to, we've got questions queuing up already. So I'm gonna ask you to rattle through the final bit. We've, we've kind of lifted up a lot of stones and looked underneath at some of the nasty stuff, some of the problems. The last section from me is just reasons to be cheerful. So the opposite it's kind of rose tinted spectacles on now please so we're going to look at how successful sustainable approaches to the water energy carbon nexus can help us join the dots on sustainability performance hit those net zero goals talking about boost financial security and well-being for residents so first dan with your with your very positive glasses on there so taking the water energy carbon nexus together how might the bathroom become a real sustainability success story for housing Tell me how that's going to happen. I'm very positive about it. It's actually probably one of the reasons that I came into the industry is that I think there's a really, there's a massive opportunity. Um, I believe in, in, in trying to give you data and evidence. So what I've, I've done is had a look at um, using uh, a next generation of our calculator, one that isn't available online, but is more detailed, to try and look at, well, if some of these small changes happen and they can happen tomorrow, mm -hmm. what might it, it actually uh, result in? So, um, okay, so I, I had a look and said, okay, if, if we assume that most most housing uh, most houses in the UK use a mixer shower, using probably a combi boiler to to, to support it, because that's that's sort of how we mm -hmm. heat our houses. If just ten percent of those households moved to using a low flow shower head, as Richard and Ben have both alluded to as well, or fitted a flow regulator, that could actually add up yearly to about three hundred million pounds saving in utilities bills. That's a combination of of your your gas and your water bills. OK, and that's based on today's prices, of course, from April and yeah, beyond. Yeah, it's going to go even yeah. further. Yeah. Um, it would save around 26,000 Olympic swimming pools worth of water. OK, that's a 50 metre swimming pool. That's a that's a lot of water and 26,000. Um, and could save about 650,000 tonnes of carbon. Now, 650,000 tonnes sounds a big number. What does it mean? That's the footprint, the annual footprint of about 400,000 vehicles on the UK roads. So we could take the equivalent of 4,000, 400,000 cars off the road just by uh, fitting low flow shower heads or flow regs okay so that's one way of doing it okay and that's that's coming at the sort of the sort of infrastructure but also the, the use phase so i haven't changed the duration of showering on any of that i've assumed seven and a half minutes mm -hmm. five five showers a week you know, standard averages okay let's assume now that the uk government accelerates the the move to to uh low carbon or no carbon electricity 
Okay, so and that, you know they've, they've set out to do that. Okay, so if if ten percent of UK households were to switch from a mixer to an electric shower, I can't, because that's what I've been able to model, mm -hmm. um, that would save one hundred and eighty uh, million pounds in utilities bills. Even though electric is much more expensive than gas, um, again, it's going to go up. That would save over thirty four thousand Olympic swimming pools and nearly a million tons. Uh, of carbon using grid electricity as it stands today okay that's about 550,000 cars if we go to zero um, carbon 100% new renewables that increases to 1.3 million tons or three quarters of a million cars so even if you were to use the electric shower on a 100% renewables tariff today if 10% of the households did that that's what they could achieve okay now those are fairly big numbers mm -hmm. and the technology exists today. We haven't even touched on the use nudges and the, and the, the volumetric reduction aspect other than the, the, the sort of low flow shower heads, but the behavior change stuff could do it in addition to that. You know, that's, it just seems like it's a, it's an absolute win win. It really, we're all about trying to help our customers save water, save energy, uh, save money ultimately, and, and ultimately save carbon. The carbon will happen for free. If you like, we don't have to worry about the carbon. It will look after itself. If we can if we can really focus on helping people understand the, the, the money side of things the cost savings and the water savings the rest will happen so i'm very positive about what can be done because the technology is here now we can do it it's it's a choice it's how we roll that out excellent strong points there so small changes can amount to big difference taken collect can collectively or cumulatively huge numbers uh you gave us there such as four hundred thousand cars off the road and the point, of course, it's existing tech and a nice closing note there that, you know, if you're saving water then effectively carbon saving comes with it for free. It's a bundle. Um, so, Ben, so the sector where affordability is critical, um, your rose tinted spectacles. My question is how we talked about scale, but how can innovation help drive down consumption costs and shrink footprints? I suppose I haven't actually said innovation in tech, I suppose you might tell me it's innovation in thinking and approach as well. But how can innovation be part of this puzzle for us? Ben. Yeah, so, um, you know, measures working in synchronization will help improve water and energy performance and, and can reduce consumption. You know, examples could be wastewater heat recovery systems. So it's looking at, you know, a package of measures um when you come to retrofit a property rather than sort of piecemeal um you know, you know approaches to it um you know clients adopting water and energy saving technology at scale can allow for the suppliers to lower their costs um and can sort of get the snowball moving in the right direction in terms of d delivering what we need to at scale over the long term um you know just using less water and energy Clearly, it's going to reduce carbon footprints. We've discussed, you know, the devices that can be used to, to help do that. Um, you know, grey water systems, dual flush toilets, you know, are all things that yep. will really cut back on that water consumption. But it's thinking of other other innovations, really. So when it comes to, you know, electric and gas consumption, you know, smart meter rollout allows householders to have in-home display units to view their consumption of energy it's just whether something similar could be implemented by water companies you know could you have an in-home display unit to tell you how many cubic meters of water that you've used and can customers make changes based on that awareness tool um you know we need to look at water consumption and how it benefits the environment you know, because it cuts back on water sourced from natural resources for some that will be you know an attractive outcome but the other angle of looking at it is freeing up disposable income for, for households that may be in fuel poverty and i think i mentioned it before but the cheapest water and energy are those that are not used in the first place so it's just by innovation trying to cut back on what water and energy would be used and in addition to that advising end users on optimal ways to operate systems to, to cut back on consumption further excellent thank you ben so yeah so nice point about the fact that a lot of the innovation is around joining up the dots it's about syncing some of these things together you know such as um 
wastewater heat recovery, for example, but sustainability, the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. Um, but a nice strong point there, though, that the cheapest water and energy is, of course, that resource that isn't used. So saving, you know, efficiency, it might be the Cinderella topic in some respect, but these savings as the bills are going up and the, the unit cost, etc., are going to become more and more precious and valuable uh, with every month, especially uh, April onwards, as Dan pointed out. So we've got the questions queuing up. So last quick one then for you, Richard, in this final um, rose tinted section, let's fast forward five or 10 years. Just paint us a quick picture of how could social housing be at the forefront of climate action? Part of the solution, not the problem. How could it be at the front of the game? I, well, going back to one of your early points, Jim, about scale, and I think uh, now is the right time to prepare for that. You can, uh, it's possible and necessary, really, because there's two big drivers. There's ESG wanting metrics. They, the banks want metrics across all environmental issues before they invest in uh, or refinance our housing associations. And then we've got Decent Homes 2 on the horizon that will... Um, hopefully look at um, water efficiency as part of the uh, resilience to climate change thing so um you can you know what i'd suggest to housing associations you can already start base lighting you you know lose a service like ours and esg reporting to uh, baseline where you are now see where you need to be and then you can start filling in the gaps using the innovative things that ben mentioned and the, the showers and other um kit that the uh, uh, installers are bringing to the case and uh, also I, I think yeah looking at five years time there is a business case for this energy efficiency and water efficiency does save money for the landlords it saves money for the residents and that's really really important but it can save money to the uh, the landlord itself and once that is out there you've got you know anticipate the regulation you've got financial benefits for the landlord financial benefits mm -hmm. to the resident what's not you're meeting all the carbon targets what's not to like so yes in richard lupo's uh utopian or dare i say lupo <laughs> lupopian world in five years time we'll uh we'll have a wonderfully water efficient uh stock and operations that operates well within the uh, water provision of this of the united kingdom excellent so we look forward to this uh lupopian that oh, you yeah. mentioned so <laughs> metrics data standards all underpinning this and the business case i think often in sustainability we're almost squeamish about making that business case, you know, to some degree, we're happy for people to do it, even if they're not doing it for what some might regard as the right reasons, it just needs to happen. So, you know, there is money to be saved and made. So, you know, we should make that business case. It, it, is, a, it is a matter of what's not to like. So we're into the last 10 minutes. There's some good stuff in the chat. And I, I think sort of say, um, Thomas and one or two others for sharing the odd link and um, Salwa and some nice comments in there, but we have questions. So panel, we have about 10 minutes. We have at least six questions. So it's going to be a pretty quick fire thing, I think. Um, so um, let me take first, uh, Ben, a couple for you. So there's one here. So um, uh, two actually. So yeah, if we take these two, so Ben, so how much pressure is there on social housing providers to ensure water is used efficiently, efficiently in their properties at the moment? How is it enforced? And I wonder if you could take that together because you mentioned the whole smart metering thing. Um, there's a question above, both of these come via LinkedIn. Um, do you think widespread use of smart meters would be a good move so the public can see what's happening? So two questions for you to kick off for us there, please, Ben. How much pressure is there on you as providers to make sure this happens? And how useful are smart meters for you and residents uh, to do that? Yeah, so, I mean, in terms of pressure on ourselves, um, I think Richard's mentioned it before, but we've got ESG commitments as a housing provider. So our first ESG report is, is on our website where people can view that. But there's core and enhanced questions there relating to the water efficiency of our housing stock. So it's something that we need to be considering um, as part of specifications on a retrofit scenario, but also on our new build developments. Um, in addition to that, um, we've got a sustainability strategy in place that we've developed with consultants. Um, so there is an ongoing commitment there um, to make sure that you know water is used efficiently within our you know customers' homes. Um, 
and yeah, it's just enforced by um, sort of updating, um, you know, investors and um, you know feeding back to sort of our executive team on, on how we're performing with regards to water efficiency. Um, and then I think the second one you had the question there was more about yeah as i mentioned before whether there could be smart water mm -hmm. meters personally i think that's a, a great idea when people don't know what they're using it's dangerous for them for their usage to, to sort of run out of control so as dan has explained certain showers can use a lot more water than a bath if you've got a little screen in the house which people seem to love screens at the moment yep. you can see that then householders can make changes to reduce that consumption. Thank you. And Richard, if I could bring you in on uh, part of that. So in terms of the pressure on housing providers and the sector, and this is in terms of water efficiency and so, is there enough pressure on those providers to be doing more? I mean, it sounds like a big stick scenario, but do they need to be more accountable? Uh, there isn't enough pressure, no. There's no there's no regulation or anything apart from what i've already mentioned esg want the metrics but you know the banks don't know what good looks like at the minute they haven't they're not chartered environmentalists like us um there's maybe part g has got a bit of it but no there's no there's no there's no pressure on uh, on housing associations at the moment i mean there's a moral pressure but uh, and uh, uh, but um, yeah no no regulatory or compliance pressures and i wonder if i could ask you a little one here taking still with you richard there and um, we're approaching the last five minutes if we take these questions about um putting us in the context of other countries there's a couple of nice ones one from linkedin saying according to the energy saving trust the average water use per day in the uk higher than many european countries why is this and the other one which is um how does uk compare to other countries on water efficiency uh, who can we learn from so i wonder if we could try taking are you able to give us a little bit of Comparison yeah, sure. and context there, please, Richard. Why do yeah, we sure. such a lot and from whom yeah. should we be learn, learning lessons? Um, well, I think um, I, I used to live in Germany and there we, you know, that was back in the mid 90s. We were all getting metered on water there. But interestingly, you were also charged on the impermeable surface on your the land that you own so your drives your roof and so you were charged for a runoff so there was a lot more of a charging you know polluter pace uh, kind of uh, mentality there and i think germany's at something like 120 liters per person per day so I mean, there's one lesson to learn but I, I don't i mean international comparisons are useful but i think you know we we're in a different country it's not spain it's not italy where there's less rainfall mm -hmm. we we have got rainfall what we should be comparing ourselves to and ben, um sorry yeah uh, dan's mentioned it a lot about the science our our country does receive a fair amount of rainfall we have got a fair amount of people we should be comparing it against what our yep. la, our land can sustain um and learn lessons where from other countries that are below that um that, that water efficiency so i think I, I think that's the thing to go is you know look at the uk see where we need to be benchmark see where you are now benchmark it against what our land can sustain and then move from there oh, good stuff thank you and yeah nice point there that about population density effectively you know we need to be comparing apples with apples um, there are always there are always some unhelpful comparisons we could pull out. So, Dan, if I could come to you with picking up a couple of those questions, uh, I don't know if um, you might want to make any mention of um, the international context or other countries or examples from abroad. But uh, maybe if you want to add to any of that. But also, I have a question here from uh, Samantha Mant. She's talking about um, water types impacting on energy consumption hard water healthy dramatically increases energy consumption she's given some figures in her question helpfully but no real discussion about treating this and reducing operational body carbon why has this been so ignored so a couple of questions i wonder if you'd like to add a little perhaps on lessons we could learn from elsewhere but also is hard water is it is it on your radar is it a discussion in the sector that you're uh, engaged in at present then um, if not, why not? It is a very good question, and it's useful to get some some inputs. And I, you know, I welcome this sort of discussion because it, it brings things to life like that. Um, obviously, scale affects the the performance of showers. Um, 
electric showers, particularly with the, the heating element. Um, we have a technology piece where we, um, through various means, look to minimize scale build up on the heating elements because, of course, it affects the efficiency and our customers then complain my shower isn't, um, or my electric shower isn't performing as it used to. Um, in terms of the, um, the energy usage, um, the way an electric shower broadly works is uh, it pull, puts into um, uh, the system eight and a half, nine and a half, ten and a half kilowatts of, of, of power for a given time, mm -hmm. uh, and you vary the flow according to the temperature that you want. Okay, so um, if the shower is performing less efficiently, um, you will see that in terms of the, the, the volume coming out. So you, you, the user will see that. Um, we, we try and reduce scale build up, as, as I said, uh, in that sense. I mean, electric shower, fortunately, is about 97% efficient uh, as a system. So it's it's starting at a quite high bar. That's not to excuse reductions, but um, mm -hmm. uh, that's a good one. In terms of wider country um, side of things, I think the psychologically, why, the way we shower in the UK is different from the way we shower in, in, in hotter countries. It's 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 uh, more about sort of warming up and what have you. Um, we do have a program um, in uh, South Africa where we're looking at uh, a water reducing shower where mm -hmm. you know, water usage is is front and center. You know, it's seen as a valuable resource because it's scarce. Um, and we're looking at, at, at uh, in that instance, of systems that can, can reduce wasted usage, both from a behavior change point of view, but also a technology uh, point of view. So there might be some information in that space in due course. But um, great, great um, questions. And I think it, for a global discussion around sharing, it's it's, it's absolutely valuable. So well, excellent. Nice bit of context. Good stuff. So last, we have one question left, and then I've got a couple of closing words. I want to ask Dan a little something extra. So just to Ben and you, Richard, first of you're going to pick up really snappily because we're into the last two minutes. So LinkedIn question, quick wins uh, without the occupant needing to act. So I wonder if you could just name check Ben first, then Richard. Can you throw us just a couple of quick wins? If we're going to try and do something tomorrow, Ben, what would it be? Um, it's just amending specifications really for, you know, kitchen and bathrooms. I think when I was working on metering programs, the highest use of water around the home, maybe flushing the toilet. So it's ensuring, you know, you, we use dual flush toilets and you've got the facility to use three or six litres, you know, whatever it may be. And second after that is, um, you know, reduced capacity baths and, you know, restricted showers. So if, if it's a mix of shower, you know, aerated shower heads, flow regulators, that's giving people the, the right equipment to keep their consumption down. Excellent, thanks, Richard. If uh, good and snappy, thanks, Ben. Pithy and punchy from you, Richard. A couple of quick yeah. wins, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, voids put aerated shower heads on uh, boiler fed uh, showers, and I know you said not occupant led, but uh, occupants go on to the water you <laughs> water suppliers uh, website and find all the free devices. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, good points there. So we've got get the spec right, aerated water showers, and access some of those free resources it is out there which of course is all part of this awareness building and communication piece into which this um webinar and triton support directly feeds so now dan closing words to you we are bang on the hour now so you have a science background personally i'd like to ask you just to say a couple of words at the end about why business industry be it building construction plumbing heating why it must listen to the science about water, energy, and carbon. Final words, Dan, please. Uh, I'll try and keep this quick. Well, one of the things we've learned from the last two years is, is the science matters. Uh, and when we follow the science, good things happen. When we don't follow the science, bad things happen. Um, in this particular situation, the science is fairly simple. It's fairly clear. Um, but we can use it to help make evidence-based decisions. Okay, we can, we can create frameworks where it's no longer about opinions. It's about objective facts. Um, and using that, that that understanding will help us make the right decisions and we will all benefit from it. We'll benefit in our pockets, we'll benefit in our communities and we'll benefit in our in our planet. So yeah, join the debate, get involved, listen to listen to the engineers and the scientists and encourage them to be open, truthful and honest about what things they can and they can't do, where the pros and the cons are because one size does not fit all. We don't have a, a golden bullet, a, a, a particular shower type, bath type, tap type that's going to solve the problems. It's got to be the right system for the right system. Very good, strong notes to finish on. So when we follow the science, good things happen. It's objective, evidence-based decision-making, which is a benefit to everybody and, and some good um, 
people words they're open truthful and honest which is business and industry we need to remember if we're talking in this behavior space so excellent work thank you thank you. so in closing big thank you to our panelists richard ben of course dan our sponsors at triton showers to yourselves out there virtual audience on crowdcast your comments questions loads of chat sharing of links been a really active group today thank you reminded to check out in case you missed it as i said at the top of the show elemental elementalexpo.com online community for professionals focused on innovation heat water air, and energy vital elements within the built environment now in the future full day of events on the website upcoming webinars back catalog including this will be available again immediately after we've finished to reshare rewatch as you choose so it's all there it's all free of charge so that is it for today thank you very much again to the panel we've worked hard in the last hour we're bang on time. I've been Jim McClellan, editor at Susmeen. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you all again soon. Cheerio. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you.